morning will be in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. We're talking about Elizabeth today and her reaction to the birth of Jesus, the birth of Christ. Last week we looked at Mary and uh, we saw her strength, we saw her humility, we saw um, the blessing that Mary is. And now we get to see the reaction of her cousin, Elizabeth. Now, she is best known for being the mother of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. And that's when people talk about John the Baptist, they usually go and they say, well, this is his mother and this is his father, and that's kind of the extent of it. But she's also a descendant of Aaron, uh, the, the great high priest, and she's married to a high priest, so one of the priests in the temple. So she is a big deal in Judaism. Let's um, read about the reaction. Verse 39 starts out, In those days Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her, leapt inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, You are the most blessed of women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside of me. She who has believed is blessed because what was spoken to her by the Lord will be fulfilled. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this interaction. Now we see the Holy Spirit at work in these reactions. Now we see the, pro the proclaiming of your truth and your coming of this world. Thank you for this transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. She was the wife of the priest, Zechariah, as we just saw in the text. And both husband and wife, the Bible is very clear, were righteous before God. And um, they had their own experience. Elizabeth was older. They were an older couple. And she was barren like Sarah of the Old Testament. And so they couldn't have a child. They never had been able to conceive a child. And so the angel Gabriel also visited her husband, like he visited Mary, to tell Mary the news. And it's really one of the funniest stories in the Bible, if you understand what you're reading. In the story itself, the reason it's so funny, it's funny to me. If you don't find it funny, I don't know what to tell you. But uh, Gabriel shows up, and he tells... Now, Zechariah's in the temple. He's doing the ceremonial stuff. He's cleansing. He's washing. He's, he's doing the things you do in the temple. And... The other guys are like, man, he sure has been in there a long time. Well, while he was in there, he got visited by an angel, by Gabriel. And Gabriel told him his wife would be with child. And he's like, he didn't believe. Now, remember last week, Mary had questions, but it wasn't disbelief. It was she was curious, how, how would this be? How is this going to happen? He was just like, no, nah, this isn't possible. How is that going to happen? So Gabriel wasn't pleased with his reaction. You should have been a little more excited, Zechariah. So now you're going to be mute. You can't talk. So Zechariah comes out, and everybody's like, man, what's going on there? He couldn't tell anybody. Later in the Bible, you see that this is the humorous part. You're like, I didn't see anything funny. This was the funny part. He comes in. He's with his family, and guess what? They're going to have a baby. And the whole family wants to know, what are you going to name the baby? And the daddy always names the baby. And so you go to the daddy and say, what's the child? Because they were all going, we're going to name him after his daddy. We're going to, he'd be Zechariah the third or something. You know, we'll do all that. And they finally came to him. And the Bible says that they made signs to him. You know, what are you going to name the baby? And, and I'm not trying to make fun of anybody, but that's funny because he wasn't deaf. They didn't have to make signs to him. They could just ask. And then he, this is the first time he spoke. He's like, John. You know? And that was wild because that wasn't a name that people used. And that, was, that was the name he was told to use. So John, he becomes the name John the Baptist. And that's what they're known for, for being the parents of John the Baptist, which makes it even crazier when you think about the ministry John the Baptist had, considering the heritage he came from 
in the highest rankings of Judaism you could be. He is of the line of Aaron on both sides of his family. He's supposed to be working in the temple, and he's out there in the wilderness wearing camel skins and eating grasshoppers, you know. So anyway, got a little ahead of myself. Elizabeth, back to our story, is about to receive a visit from her cousin. Mary's her cousin. And she's about to receive a, a, a visit from her while she's probably about six months with child. She's six months pregnant. And uh, Mary is going to stay with her a few months. I think you can kind of read into that. Mary is just, her whole family and everybody's just discovered she's with child and they just shipped her off to another town just to kind of keep everything, you know, keep the mess down, keep the down low, keep the, you know, it's a small town, a small village, everybody's talking, let's just send her away for about three months. So we're going to go with Mary on this journey. She had to take a journey to get to Elizabeth's house. Let's go back to verse 39. In those days, Mary set out. I mean, she got prepared. She got her stuff together. I'm sure somebody was taking her. And she hurried. She hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. That's her destination. This hill country area, uh, Larry gets tired of me saying this, but I've been there. And um, this area, it, it looks different now. It's actually pretty swanky if you go up in there. But in that day, it would have been a stone village, lots of stone uh, villages standing around, a lot of rocks. Um, and the village is cut out of the rocks. You've got everything built out of rocks, but it's very fertile land, too. Don't think about the stuff you see in movies where everything's dust and dirt like everybody lived in the desert. They didn't. And it, the, in the valley areas, it was just lush and beautiful areas back then, and it is today. And you go in there now, and there's you know apartments and houses and stuff in there. But... This village is where she's headed. And as she's going into this place, what, what happens is we often do this. We have in our back of our Bibles these maps, you know. And they got the red lines and stuff, and you look at them. And you always have like the exodus of uh, Moses and the children of Israel leaving. And it shows you the route they took because in the story it tells you where they went. We have it on the map. You also have in the back of your Bibles often you'll have uh, the missionary journeys of Paul back there. And you have it mapped out and you can follow along. First missionary journey, the second missionary journey, all that stuff in there. You don't see it, but they could do that with Mary's journey. And I'm going to take you through the journey. I didn't go through the trouble to put a map up on the screen, but uh, I'll take you through it verbally and let you see she is headed south from Nazareth and going down into Judea, uh, Judah, I'm sorry. And this is the same route that she would have taken, her family would have taken to go into the holy city on their pilgrimages. So this probably wasn't the first time these people had done that. That's what they would have done. But it's a long journey, and you're going, you know, on donkey or whatever, mostly on foot, and they're headed down to this, these western hills. And really, in certain parts of it, when you look, she probably had just this whole view of the country for miles. Not everything, of course, but for miles she could see. And you got to remember, it's a small, small country. There's not... So she's going to walk literally. The reason I bring this up, the beauty of it, and maybe I'm just a Bible geek in the room, but I love the fact that she's about to literally take a walk through your Old Testament. She's going to walk through place after place, and she the whole time is carrying the Savior of the world with her, and she's walking through all the stories and all the backgrounds, all his, the lineage, all the everything. She's walking through the areas. If you follow through, the best you can chronologically through the Old Testament, you're going to, she's walking through the stories that lead up to the moment where the Messiah does come and springs forth from her bloodline. She's going to go through Mount Carmel where Elijah de defeated and conquered the priest of Baal. She's going to go to, through Megiddo where in the Bible um, Josiah was laying there dying. She's going to go through Jezreel where uh, Ahab has sinned. She's going to go to Brook uh, Kashan in that area where Deborah, if you go through the book of Judges, where Deborah sang her song when Sisera was slain. I mean, these are big moments. And all of the Jews and everybody would pass these stories down, and they actually at this time had it in written form, and they would tell these stories. And Mary would go straight from there, and she would actually go past Joseph's grave, you know Joseph, the coat of many colors, Joseph. They, he said, do not leave my bones here in Egypt. And they took his bones and put them in Israel, and she would have gone past his grave. 
and um, probably took notice of that. The whole family would have and told the story of Joseph as they were going through. She would have, uh, after that, there was a long way that she would have stopped, more than likely, at Jacob's well, right through there, going into that area. And perhaps she even stopped and um, had a drink at Jacob's well, you can just imagine. And then she goes from there, and she goes, and she can see Jerusalem coming up. And as you get into Jerusalem, and you see the rooftops, and you see the gold shimmer, and the, the stone. The, the, everything changes as you go into the Jerusalem. The, the buildings and the stone that they use is different from where she's from. And the rooftops are made out of different tiles. And there's a buzz in the air, and the population is growing. And she would have gone into that city, and she would have gone there and be the, seeing these things like the temple and all these other things. And... She would see the rooftop of the temple shining in the sun, and soon she's going to cross from there to this tiny little place called Bethlehem where a lot of things occur. And She'd go through the very fields that David tended his father's sheep and him directly, you know, so much prophecy about Jesus being in the line of David, and then she's in those fields, and she would walk through the same path. And there's a beautiful story of Ruth. Ruth and Naomi took a path as they went along leaving Orpah. And so she would have had to then get on the road because the roads didn't change, the paths didn't change. And she would have been on the same path as Ruth. And then Ruth, the one that gets with Boaz, and they bring forth, and that's his direct line to Jesus as he continued to go on. She would have um, gone through Abraham's oaks, and she would have gone through, probably stopped there, and they would have eaten lunch and shaded themselves in that area. And I mean, all through this is a walk through history, through our Bible. It's not just, well, Mary just left and went to Elizabeth's house. you got to understand that with God, there's a lot of sentimental stuff. There's a lot of connections that go back as you transition. Don't forget, we are transitioning from an old covenant to a new covenant, and we are going through this. We've already had, last week, we had Mary's song. And the Mary's song was a connection back to the Old Testament with Deborah's song and, and uh, Miriam's song and the women of old of the Old Testament that would have these songs and sing about the glory of God. And Mary did that just like they did. It's all connected. It all goes back in the writings. God wants you to see the connection and not lose sight. This is not a separate thing. You can't take away the Old Testament and say, well, now that we are of Jesus and we're in the New Testament, we can throw away all that Jewish stuff. and all." That. No, you can't throw away any of it. It is connected all throughout. It's very important that as she is walking through history itself, she is carrying the one who is going to change everything. Folks, you can change the meaning of B.C. and A.D. all you want to, but still the one who was born at that time is the reason there's a split in the timeline. I mean, you can say what it is, whatever you want to call it, but it's still before he was born and after he was born. I know that's not what the symbols, the letters mean now. She's bringing the difference. All those places she went, everybody, we're talking about Abraham and all those other people, they're looking forward to the Messiah. They're looking forward to the one that's going to bring the hope, and she's the one carrying them. Nobody would have ever dreamed walking along that path. Other people came on that road. They never would have dreamed walking on that path and passing this little girl that she's bringing salvation of the world into this, in this place. How many times do we walk by the things that God is doing and God at work and we can't recognize it and we don't know it and then we have the audacity to say with our materialistic minds and we only see the material world, well, I just don't see God working in anything. God was literally going past people that couldn't see Him. Don't you doubt God in the midst of the suffering and struggles of this world. God is at work. He's been work, at work throughout history and He may be in the middle of something you just can't see it and don't know about it and you're not privileged to it right now and that's okay but that's where your faith has to come in so then she arrives at Elizabeth's house I mean, it took a while and she gets there and then Elizabeth is inspired by the Holy Spirit this is where we get the third here we got we got all the Trinity showing up together you know and she's inspired by the Holy Spirit when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting give me verse 40 go back to verse 40 first where she entered Zach Zachariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. So Mary comes and greets her. And then when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, as soon as she heard her words, the baby leaped inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now Luke 
chapter 1, verse 15, the angel said that the baby in Elizabeth would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. So the angel told him this was going to happen. All right? This is where we have to, non-Christians have to understand why we're so passionate about abortion. It's because of things like this. This is not a clump of cells. The Holy Spirit of God, if you, if you understand theology and you understand how doctrine works and you understand biblical teaching, you have to understand that the Holy Spirit of God doesn't fill anybody but human beings. So that means this baby, we're going to see here in a moment, we we're talking about Elizabeth, that the baby is going to be filled too. And the Holy Spirit cannot fill a clump of cells. The Holy Spirit fills people. So this baby is, a, so you have to understand that's why we are so passionate about abortion. And you have to understand that's why we got a real big problem if you call yourself Christian and you're a supporter of abortion in any form whatsoever. It flies in the face of everything biblically. Now, mothers are familiar with babies kicking in their stomachs. They, this happens all the time. And she's about six months. So, But this was something different. Mary knew Elizabeth was with child. But the indication in the scripture is that Elizabeth really didn't know why Mary, they didn't, it ain't like they texted and said, hey, Mary's coming up, you know, and hey, don't tell anybody, but she's, there was no cell phone, there was no social media, there was nothing like that. So the indication from reading, when you read through the story is, Elizabeth just thought her cousin was coming. Not that she knew of the controversy that was going on. And Elizabeth was probably really excited to tell her cousin, but you ain't going to believe what we've been going through. Gabriel and all this stuff. And Mary's like, well, I don't want to be the one that tops everybody, but I talked to Gabriel myself. Now, she didn't know, apparently. So it does not appear that she knew about Mary. She may not have known that Mary was chosen to carry the Messiah even if she thought she was pregnant. Even if she thought she was with child and, oh, she's a troubled teen coming to my house and we're going to keep her out of trouble for three months, she still didn't know this is the Messiah in her. So Elizabeth has no idea. But the moment that she was greeted by Mary, then the Holy Spirit filled her. She was filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with a spirit of prophecy. And Elizabeth comes to the knowledge of the Messiah through a revelation from God through the Holy Spirit. And it would be exactly what Mary needed. Because remember, people, Mary's got, I mean, are people going to believe this young girl? There's people that didn't. There, I mean, there's all kinds of stories about that she conceived from a Roman soldier, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. The family had to deal with that mess. And she's going in to Elizabeth. Now listen, Mary, she's the poor cousin who lives off over here Family ain't got nothing. How do I know that? Because she was betrothed to a much older man who was just a carpenter. He ain't nobody. He wasn't in the ministry. He wasn't at the temple. He wasn't all this. And so you know, some of you might know how it is to be the lower class cousin and have to go to the high dollar cousin's house and do stuff. Y'all don't know. Y'all are the high dollar cousins, aren't y'all? I was trailer trash, okay? I can talk about it. So if you come from back in the day and you come from nothing and you come up, so she's got to be anxious about the fact that my well-to-do older cousin who has made it in life, who has a successful husband and a successful ministry and a successful life, living in a very nice house. If you worked in the temple, you lived in nice houses. And she walks up and she's got to be wondering, what is she going to think of me? This little old lowly cousin from the trailer park that's pregnant. And she's greeted with this wonderful field of the Holy Spirit. And she begins to prophesy. And it shows you something about Elizabeth, too, that's beautiful. This woman was just humble. She could have been filled with pride. She could have said, why not me with the Messiah? I'm of the lineage of Aaron. I'm of the lineage of the high priest. I married a man of the high priest. Why this little old nobody girl? No, she didn't do any of that. She didn't let jealousy get in the way. She didn't, have, she didn't look down upon her. She didn't. She could have easily became jealous. 
kind of like a child who's been the baby the whole time and then another child is brought into the family and you're no longer the baby and that's all cute when they're a little baby but that that's not fun when they're grown-ups and I, I read a story about they called it da vinci's self-ruin self-ruin leonardo da vinci was very you know you know the name so therefore you understand he was very famous in his area for his art and his uh, everything else he did he was an engineer as well but Leonardo da Vinci was asked by a council of their area to bring in some sketches they wanted to look at so he put together some sketches and then they asked a new up-and-comer guy who nobody had heard of called Michelangelo to bring in some sketches too and they said in that that the council actually liked Michelangelo's sketches better than he did da Vinci's sketches and one of the leaders of the council said da Vinci is getting old and they said in this story that Leonardo da Vinci never got over those words and he lived the rest of his life in the eclipse of his fame always just being miserable living in gloom and sorrow because somebody else came along that was better I tell you that story to let you know in case you struggle with envy, if you're envious of anybody and anybody, especially if they're doing God's work and you're envious of that, you need to know envy shoots at others, but it only wounds itself. That's an old saying for a reason, because it's true. Look at the humility that this has brought to this woman who had every right to be the one. If anybody's going to be the one, it would even make sense. It looks like Old Testament stuff, man. We're going back. If, if God had decided to bring the Messiah through Elizabeth, we'd go, I'd be preaching a whole sermon connecting her to Sarah in the Old Testament and Abraham and that story, how God brought full circle the story of Abraham and Sarah to be filled through Zechariah and Elizabeth. And it'd be this beautiful story. There'd be books written about it. And we'd all, but God didn't do it the way we think he should do it. He picked that little old girl in the middle of nowhere that had nothing. But I'm going to use her. Let's look at verse 43 of the text. This is her words. How could this happen to me? That the mother of my Lord. Now, now, the Holy Spirit of God has just revealed to her the Messiah, the Lord. How does she know? How does she know that the Lord should come to me? Elizabeth thought herself unworthy to be visited by her little old cousin, Mary who was nobody. People filled with the Holy Spirit of God, they have a low opinion of their own self-worth. Not, not a, oh, I'm just so pitiful, or no, but who could love me? And all. Now, that's pathetic. That's not, that's not humility. But a low opinion of your own merits and your own work and that God doesn't need you and God can do these things without you and it's just God has shown favor upon you to allow you to do these things for His name. And if He shows favor upon somebody else, you can be happy for them if you're filled with the Spirit of God to go, I am so glad, that I'm just unworthy to be in the presence of the one that's doing the work of God in our presence. And that's the way she responds to Mary. This little girl, Mary, needed to hear this. She needed to be built up. She needed to be encouraged. And there's all kinds of people that take, and they want to, teach a doctor and to say that the evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit is that you will speak in tongues. And I want to tell you, throughout Scripture, it's supported more that the evidence of somebody being filled with the Holy Spirit is that they are humble before God. You show me a proud person, they're not filled with the Spirit of God. Look at the humility that we see here. You could go place after place in the Bible. Humility. This woman could have got full of herself. She could have been made it about herself. She could have done all those things, but she didn't. And that's my point, too, this morning. What, 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 what in Elizabeth's reaction can we learn? Humility before God? Are you so proud and arrogant that you don't think you need God? Are you so proud and arrogant that you think you have something to offer God? Are you so proud and arrogant that you're annoyed by having to do certain things because what about me? Why about me? Why not me? Why can't I? Do? Are you, listen, can we celebrate other people? Can we take joy that some, God chooses his favor upon other people? It's all by his choosing. 
Not everybody called into ministry is going to be the mega church pastor. Not everybody called to do this and that is going to be. Not everybody gifted to sing is going to be the guy that gets to sing in front of thousands of people and have people come up all the that, let's, let's just be what God would have us to be. John, John the Baptist, he didn't work in the temple. He wasn't at the mega church. He didn't even have a ministry as wonderful as his father's ministry. They looked at him as a fruit loop, lost his mind. He, think about him. John the Baptist was a loser. And I'm not just trying to play off the series, The Chosen, but really when you lead through your Bible, he was an embarrassment to the ministry, to the temple, for the priests. The son of the priest shouldn't act that way. And then he called them all, you know, bad things and told them how horrible they were and stuff. So there it is. But his ministry was just failed. Think about Jesus himself. How many times did Jesus go and get a large crowd up and then run them all off? By today's standards, we look and we go, man, Jesus can't keep anybody. And uh, every time we turn around, he, he starts talking about crazy stuff like eating flesh and all that. All these things that you and I look at like the world. Okay, Elizabeth, and I, I'm going to close here in a moment, but I want to make this connection. Elizabeth, by the world standards and religious standards, religious standards, she was way more important than Mary. Did God look at that? No. I mean, I can't help but think about David when Saul, when um, the prophet Samuel shows up and he's like, God's chosen a king from your sons. Bring me your sons so I can anoint them. And if you've been in Sunday school, you know the story. Bring out the best, oldest, tallest, good-looking guy. Not him. This one, not him. This one, I don't know how many sons he had, but it was a bunch of them. And he's like, is there any more sons? Do you have anybody else? He's like, well, he's got the runt of the litter. He's out there. We didn't even, he's out there working with the sheep. We didn't even bathe him. He's still out there doing his thing. You want him? And little old ruddy David walks in. That's how he's described. And boom, that's the one. Because God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks on the inward appearance. If God wants you to be great for his namesake, guess what? You'll be great for his namesake. But if God would have you not take that task on, can you celebrate those that he is using? Can we support them? Can we lift them up? Because by the standards of how we see it today, 2,000 years from now, the ones that we think are so successful and wonderful, they're not going to be. And the ones that looked like they were failures and stuff, they were the ones that were faithful in doing what God wanted them to do. Let's let God work it all out. So let's not get envious and let's not get prideful. But what I want us to see in this, the main point, be humble. Let the reactions to the birth of the Messiah humble us. And it should humble you enough to do one more thing. Examine your heart. Examine your heart. Do you know this Jesus? Can you say, like she said, that the mother of my Lord, She's already accepted him as her Lord and Savior. Have you done that? Have you humbled yourself and repented of your wretched sinfulness? You can't repent of your sin if you're not humble. If you're not willing, if you're prideful, you're not going to be able to repent. Have you repented of your sins and declared Jesus as your Lord over your life, master of your life? Father, Lord, if there's anything we as individuals need to do to make things right with you. I pray that we're given that opportunity. Pray, God, that the filling of your Holy Spirit be working here. But Lord, if any of my brothers and sisters deal and struggle with self and lifting self up, God, I pray that we humble ourselves before you today. And God, that we accept that you are God and we are not. And you work the way you want to work. And you choose the way you want to choose. And you, you lead the way you want to lead. And we just want to, we just want to get in on that and follow you and learn from you and grow. We thank you for this time. We thank you for Christmas and celebration of this. But most of all, we pray for an opportunity to make things right with you. Would you stand with us as we sing? If you need to